It's Friday, it's 12.15 and this is Politics UK. Welcome to your weekly roundup of parliamentary highlights. I'll be joined by correspondents in Edinburgh and Cardiff, and here in Westminster by our parliamentary correspondent, Susan Hume. On the programme this week, the government and Labour butt heads over who is to blame for rail strikes. The Prime Minister of this country and his Transport Secretary haven't attended a single meeting, held a conversation or lifted a finger to stop these strikes. The reason his authority is on the line in this matter is that they take, they take £10 million from the unions. Stories of patients taking their dental work into their own hands as the NHS backlog is discussed in the Commons. I am in such agony that I took ibuprofen, drank whiskey, and tried to pull it out myself with pliers. The debate over ministerial ethics rumbles on. Lord Guy couldn't stomach it any longer, and I don't blame him. To this Prime Minister, ethics is a county east of London. The government cannot support today's motion for the simple reason that it attempts by proxy to change the British Constitution by the back door. And Wales's Health Minister is forced to apologise in the Senate. There's an expectation on all of us to uphold the highest standards, and throughout this process, I've accepted that I've failed to do so through my actions in this case. Susan. It's been a difficult week for commuters. Rail strikes across the country prevented many people from going about their normal routines. But in Westminster, there was a bit of a blame game going on. And that issue certainly dominated Prime Minister's questions. Yes, it certainly did. And it has been a week. Not everyone needs the train to get to work, but for a lot of us, it was time to pump up mm. the bike tyres or work from home, wasn't it? Um, it did all play out at Prime Minister's questions. Now, it's surprising because the government kind of wants to talk about this. You'd have thought maybe with a crisis that they would rather not talk about it, but they see some political mileage uh, in painting Labour as the striker's friend because of their union backing. Labour come back and say, well, we're not in government, nothing very much that we can do about strikes either way. So that all played out at Prime Minister's questions. But it started off with a question from a Labour MP who I think probably wanted to put the Prime Minister off his stroke at the start by asking about reports that uh, the Prime Minister had in the past um, tried to appoint his now wife, Carrie Johnson, to various jobs. One is his Chief of Staff as Foreign Secretary when he was Foreign Secretary and also uh, a job with a, a Royal Environmental Charity. Has he ever considered the appointment of his current spouse to a government post or to any organisation yeah. yes. in one of the royal households. Be honest, Prime Minister, yes or no? Yes or no? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I know why the, uh, the party opposite wants to talk about uh, non-existent jobs uh, in, the, in the media, Mr Speaker, because they don't want to talk about what's going on in the real world. If he's genuine about preventing strikes, will the Prime Minister tell this House how many meetings he or his Transport Secretary have had with rail workers this week to actually stop the strikes? Mr Speaker, this is, this is the government that loves the railways, that invests in the railways. Not, not £96 billion we're putting into the integrated railway plan building. Not just, I'm proud of built cross rail, by the way, Mr Speaker. And we're going to build Northern Powerhouse Rail, but what we've got to do is modernise our railways, Mr Speaker. So he yesterday had 25 Labour MPs out on the picket line, out on the picket line, to find instructions. I want to hear the Prime Minister's answer, even if you don't. I think you ought to show some respect for the Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Out on the 25 and, and, and the shadow deputy leader, out on the, the picket line, uh, Mr Speaker, backing the strikers, Mr Speaker, while we back the strivers. 
Mr. Speaker, I am surprised he's giving me advice about my team. If I do need advice, let's say about a hundred thousand pound job at the Foreign Office, I, I will ask him for recommendation. Uh, and, and there you Mr Speaker. There you have it. The Prime Minister of this country and his Transport Secretary haven't attended a single meeting, held a conversation or lifted a finger to stop these strikes. But I did note that on Monday they did find time to go to a lavish ball where the Prime Minister sold a meeting with himself for £120,000 to a donor. If there's money coming his way, he's there. If it- He's nowhere to be seen. So rather than blame everyone else, why doesn't he do his job, get round the table and get the trains running? Mr Speaker, uh, we are making sure that we do everything we can to prevent uh, these strikes. As he knows, it is up to the railway companies uh, to negotiate. Uh, That is their job. Uh, We've spent £16 billion looking after the railways, Mr Speaker, throughout the pandemic. That's cost every household £600. And at the same time, we know why he takes the line he does. We know why he won't condemn the strikes. The reason his authority is on the line in this matter is that they take they take ten million pounds uh, from the unions, Mr Speaker. That's the fee. That's the fee that the learned gentleman opposite is receiving for the case he is failing to make. After twelve years in government the Tories have left the UK economy in the doldrums and pushed millions of people into poverty. So, can I ask the Prime Minister, does he think his government bears any blame for the fact that the United Kingdom is doing so much worse than our European neighbours? Actually, Mr Speaker, I think the whole House knows and the whole country knows we've got a global inflationary problem, but this government has the uh, the fiscal firepower to, to deal with it. Uh, Mr Speaker, and that is, I think, of benefit to the whole of the United Kingdom, including uh, Scotland, as we've seen uh, throughout the uh, pandemic. And I think it's a matter of fact that taxes are actually highest of all uh, in Scotland, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister under fire there at Prime Minister's question. Susan, there was also a big announcement from the government on changes that they've talked about in the past to the Human Rights Act. What was being announced? This is a long-term passion of Dominic Raab, the Justice Secretary, and many other Conservative MPs as well, uh, to replace the Human Rights Act with a British Bill of Rights. Now, the plan would be that it would allow the UK to disregard some rulings from the European Court of Human Rights, which has nothing to do with the EU, by the way. Um, He says that it would restore a bit of common sense. It would get rid of things that he doesn't like. For example, dangerous forward criminals uh, from being deported by claiming that being deported would violate their right to family life. Um, However, uh, uh, opponents say this is dangerous, that it will reduce people's freedoms and human rights. But uh, Dominic Raab is insistent that the UK already has a proud tradition and can be trusted with human rights. Mr Speaker, we have a proud tradition of freedom under the rule of law in this country and I would remind honourable members on all sides that it dates back centuries to Magna Carta, not just 1998. The Bill of Rights is the next chapter in the evolution and the strengthening of our human rights framework. The UK intends to remain a state party to the European Convention on Human Rights. It is a common sense set of principles and the problems that we have uh, encountered have stemmed from the elastic interpretations and the expansion, absent meaningful democratic oversight, in particular as a result of the procedural framework set out in the Human Rights Act. We will also expressly, Mr Speaker, provide for greater weight to be given to Parliament's determination of the public interests set out in primary legislation when considering the interpretation of rights to ensure we are better equipped to protect the public. And that will reinforce our ability to, for example, deport more foreign national offenders, and in particular those claiming ever more elastic interpretations of Article 8 and the right to family life to frustrate the deportation process. Our Bill of Rights will strengthen our proud tradition of freedom, it will demarcate a clearer separation of powers, it will ensure greater respect for our democratic institutions, and it will better protect the public and restore a healthy dose of common sense to the justice system, which is essential for commanding public confidence. 
Ultimately, it will make us freer, it will help keep our streets safer, and I commend this statement to the House. This is a very dark day for victims of crime, for women, for people in care, for everyone in this country who rely on the state to protect them from harm. This is not a Bill of Rights, it's a con. The Human Rights Act has allowed people to object when doctors put do not resuscitate orders on their beds without their consent. It's allowed people with learning disabilities imprisoned in locked units to be reunited yep. with their families. Yep. It's allowed families of major disasters like Manchester or Hillsborough to seek justice where public bodies have let them down. Yep. It's allowed elderly married couples in residential care to object when care home managers try to separate them. And it's allowed victims of rapists like John Warboys from forcing the police to investigate cases of rape. Here, here. This bill will see enormous amounts of red tape for victims of crime seeking justice. It's an attack on women. It undermines peace in Northern Ireland. It's the hallmark of a party out of ideas that can no longer govern. Here, here. This morning, the distinguished legal commentator Joshua Rosenberg summed up this bill not as the biggest constitutional tour de force in over 300 years or the apex of the Justice Secretary's career, but as a rag bag of restrictions. It will undoubtedly cause harm to many thousands of our citizens, especially those who are most vulnerable and suffer discrimination by an unchecked state, and it will cause harm to this country's hard-won reputation as a champion of international law. He will recall that some of the gravest crimes of the Iraq War were only revealed through recourse to the Human Rights Act enforced in our domestic courts. I think particularly of the systematic torture of detainees by British soldiers in Basra that was revealed in the Baha Musa case, uh, only because of the Human Rights Act after the Ministry of Defence had declined to investigate. So can he provide reassurances to the House that the new Bill of Rights will not operate to suppress such serious human rights abuses from coming to light in the future. The reality is we have the international law of armed conflict which is designed to that and it has been unhelpful, indeed it has created legal uncertainty to layer on top of that an extra tier of human rights obligations. It's created uncertainties to the state of the law and created huge uncertainty for our armed forces. So we'll make sure that there is the accountability she, uh, she, um, she, she, she looks for, but we will also deal with the extraterritorial jurisdiction, which frankly has encouraged litigation and many spurious claims, as well as the ones that she mentions. Can I welcome this statement and say it is rather curious that my right honourable friend has been criticised for acting upon the democratic mandate given to him within our manifesto by millions of our fellow citizens. Millions of voters in this country voted in both the Brexit referendum and in the general election in 2019 for uh, control of our borders and to prevent illegal immigration. It is the job of courts to interpret the will of Parliament, not to invent law themselves. And therefore, the policy that he's putting in place, the Bill of Rights, not only protects the fundamental rights that we all enjoy, but gives the, vo the democratic voice of the British people a role in the decision-making process. Susan, thank you for now. We'll be back to you with other developments at Westminster shortly. Time to go to Edinburgh and join our Scotland political correspondent there, Phil Sim. Hello to you. He's at Holyrood. Phil, it was an uncomfortable first minister's questions for Nicola Sturgeon this week because there was a lot of focus on her party's handling of a sexual harassment complaint at Westminster. Yes, I mean, I may be here at Holyrood, but a lot of the questions, as you say, were about Westminster, specifically the SNP's response to the, uh, the case of one of their MPs, Patrick Grady, being suspended from the Commons for two days for making an unwanted sexual advance towards a member of party staff. Now, that suspension was mirrored by the SNP, but they've been coming under a lot of pressure to do more, to go further, and that particularly came after a recording of the party's Westminster Group meeting was leaked, in which uh, senior MPs, including the group leader Ian Blackford, were urging members to support Mr Grady with apparently little mention of the victim being made. Now Nicola Sturgeon has been challenged about that. She says she stands by her position that there should be zero tolerance of sexual harassment. There should be total support for victims and for people who come forward with complaints. But she's faced multiple questions about how seriously her party is taking this. If everything the First Minister has just said is true, and she really believes that victims of sexual harassment should be fully supported. Why is Patrick Grady, one of her MPs who has been found guilty of sexual harassment, 
still got the backing of the First Minister. Uh, Patrick Grady's behaviour was investigated by an independent process, uh, an independent process that all parties in the House of Commons, uh, as I understand, are signed up to. Uh, the findings of that independent process were, of course, published, as is right and proper, and a sanction was imposed, a sanction that was recommended by that independent process uh, and replicated uh, by the SNP Westminster Group. Uh, in this situation, uh, there is also clearly uh, a victim uh, who feels that they were not uh, properly supported uh, in that process. Indeed, uh, the uh, victim in this case uh, believes that the process exacerbated uh, the trauma that was experienced, and I think it is absolutely incumbent uh, on any organisation in that position uh, to take views of that nature uh, very seriously. And as I have already said before today, and I have already said this today, uh, that is a matter that the SNP must and will reflect on. So yes, this was an uncomfortable session at Holyrood for Nicola Sturgeon. She offered an apology to that staff member who's been speaking out in the media about their treatment. And it was striking that she didn't really offer any defence of Patrick Grady. She didn't either offer any defence of her Westminster group as a whole. I think she wanted to focus, unlike in that recording that was leaked, to be on supporting the victim. Now, this is a familiar concern for the Scottish Government. There was a, a long-running inquiry here at Holyrood about the Government's handling of harassment complaints against the former former First Minister Alex Salmond. I think the last thing that Nicola Sturgeon will want will be to be dragged into being bogged down in that kind of issue once again. Phil, let's talk about a devolved matter, because there's been some movement on one of the Scottish Government's big policy pledges for this term, and that's the creation of a national care service. What's happening? Yes, yeah, so this is really the, the big thing other than an independence referendum, obviously, that the Scottish Government wants to do in this parliamentary term. They want to set up a national care service that's essentially an NHS but for social care, and they say this has the ambition to be the biggest reform since the NHS was set up. And the idea behind it is that it would set national standards for adult social care and would end any kind of postcode lottery in the provision of that care around Scotland. Now, the first legislation underpinning that in NCS was published this week. There has been some opposition, though, um, about this being a centralising move. Uh, responsibility would be moving to ministers here in Edinburgh rather than for councils around the country to deal with. And the Conservatives have also raised concerns about the cost. They say it could cost half a billion pounds to set up this centralised agency. And they've questioned whether that money could be put to better use elsewhere. For context, for context, half a billion pounds would cover the salaries of 14,000 qualified nurses. Instead, the National Care Service is expected to hire up to 700 new staff, mainly managers and administrators. It will be mainly staffed by civil servants, not social care professionals. We simply can't afford to see money of this magnitude diverted from frontline local services. This will be compounded by a loss of local decision making and accountability, financial instability and the risk that upheaval will negatively impact the most vulnerable in our society. A national care service has at the heart of it collective bargaining. Yeah. It has at the heart of it ethical commissioning. Yeah. It has at the heart of it fair work for social care workers. Yeah. It has at the heart of it human rights of care home relatives. Yeah. So the NCS, the National Care Service, stands up and embeds everything that the Tories oppose. And I'll take no lectures, none whatsoever from the Tories about yeah. social care. That is the party, they are the party that dragged Scotland out of the EU against its will, causing untold damage to social care up and down this country. So the plan is to have this National Care Service up and running by the end of the current parliamentary term in 2026. So it's a long-running thing. I think there's going to be a lot of debate about that here at Holyrood. But for all that, it is going to happen. We know the, the SNP Green government has a majority in the chamber. But there's going to be a lot of discussion, I think, about what exactly this will look like and how it's going to be delivered to people across Scotland. Let's talk about the cost of living crisis. It obviously remains a key issue, particularly after the latest inflation figures. There's been uh, much debate about the measures governments are taking to support people through it. 
Yes, I mean the cost of living crisis is obviously the, one of the most pressing things facing not just politicians but of course people around the country and we've seen these UK wide measures that have been coming in whereby all UK households will be getting a, a £400 credit towards their energy bills coming in in October. Now there's a bit of dispute here because that will apply to people not just who have one home but also those who have two or more so if you have more than one property you could get £800 instead of £400 and there have been questions here at Holyrood about how fair that is. Labour tabled a debate saying that there should be a second homeowner should not get both payments and that instead some of that money should go towards low income households and they appear to have won the support of the Scottish Government for that. Now, we often talk about someone having to choose between heating and eating, but that's really a polite way of putting it. The reality is that thousands will choose between starving or freezing. People will die this winter. That's a crisis that will only get worse, so the government must respond with action. And the irony won't be lost on anyone then that those best off, those able to afford to run not one but two homes, are set to pocket a windfall of almost £10 million between them, allowing a select few to pocket a £400 bung because they collectively own or rent 24,000 second homes. 1% of all stock in this country will not deliver the fairness we expect. We agree that it is clearly wrong that second homeowners benefit from the £400 energy rebate, rebate from the UK Government that the UK Government is making available. Using the council tax system to recover this £400 has merit, but is not straightforward. So, we will work with COSLA and local government to examine all options to recover this money, including through a council tax levied on second homes. In fact, we will explore going beyond just second homes and also consider applying a similar measure to long-term empty homes as well. Now, this may not seem like the biggest thing in the world. It's kind of a technical fix they're looking for here. But it's just a sign of how governments are doing anything they can to squeeze any extra money they can out of what are already tight budgets. They need to make sure every penny counts, I think, and the, the public expect them to deliver on these sort of things in order to support them through the cost of loan crisis. Thank you very much, Phil. That's Phil Sim, our correspondent there at Holyrood. Um, Susan Hume, our parliamentary correspondent, is still here with me. Uh, one issue, Susan, that often gets mentioned at the moment is the NHS back backlog and access to services, particularly post uh, the pandemic. That was the subject of a debate chosen by the Labour Party. What was it about? Well, during the pandemic, as you're saying, a uh, lot of pent-up demand, a lot of people didn't go to the doctor or the dentist then, and now they do want to. So it can be very difficult to get an appointment, particularly a face-to-face -face one. So this debate had a, a lot of stories, of grim stories, mm -hmm. of the difficulty people have had getting treatment. And uh, if you feel a bit delicate about dentists and teeth or anything like that, you might want to pop your fingers in your ears for some of those stories. Um, Labour have said it's not just about the pandemic, though. It is also about government funding and about management. And, of course, all that played out during the debate. We know why patients are forced to wait. Conservative governments have cut 4,500 GPs over the last decade. They've closed 300 practices since the last election, and they've failed to provide any meaningful reform of the system. The public are sick and tired of waiting. He makes grand statements in support of the NHS, but I'm afraid his actions do not support the NHS. He has backed today these train and tube strikes, which has meant in my, con which has meant in my constituency patients cannot get to hospital, nurses cannot get to their places of work, and nor can doctors. Can we have better action rather than words? I am very, very grateful to the Honourable Lady for that intervention. Our party has been clear. We didn't want to see the strikes go ahead. We believe the strikes could have been averted if the government had shown responsible action. Let me tell the Health Secretary about a constituent of my colleague, the Right Honourable Member for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford, the Shadow Home Secretary. She told me that one of her constituents can't get a dentist appointment anywhere for an unbearable toothache, and they're in too much pain through the night. When her constituents contacted a dentist, he was told he would have to wait two years for an appointment. He wrote in an email, and I quote, 
I am in such agony that I took ibuprofen, drank whiskey, and tried to pull it out myself with pliers, but they kept slipping off, and it was agony. Mr Speaker, I hope that he can see the irony, some might even say the hypocrisy, of his sudden interest in access to public services on today of all days. It's thanks to the strikes that he's been so vocal in supporting that people right across the country, they can't make their appointments. And I know, of course, that the pandemic has brought some unimaginable pressures. And equally, I know that many of those pressures haven't gone away now that we're living with COVID. The Honourable Gentleman talks as though he doesn't know where these pressures have come from, as if he's had his, as if he's had his head under a rock for two years. We know that, Mr Speaker, as the NHS has said, that they believe that between 11 to 13 million people stayed away from the NHS, including the, from their GPs and dentists. Under the last uh, NHS long-term plan, we made a historic commitment of an extra £34 billion a year. That was before the pandemic. We then, because of the pandemic, necessarily put in huge amounts of extra funding, £92 billion of extra funding. And at the last spending review, we increased funding still further so that the NHS budget will reach some £162.6 billion by 2024-25, supported in part by a new New health and social care levy. The opposition make a big point of 12 years, but of course it takes 10 years to train a GP and it takes longer than that to train a consultant. So actually the, 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 the shortage is, was created during their time and we're trying to fix it. The truth is that the government has failed to recruit the GPs that we need. We have a retirement time bomb amongst our general practice and we know that dentists are leaving NHS work as well. We really need to see a serious plan from the government so that everybody who needs to see a GP or a dentist can actually see one. Susan, last week we also saw the shock resignation of the Prime Minister's ethics adviser, Lord Christopher Guite. Soon afterwards, Downing Street said Boris Johnson was considering abolishing the post altogether. Unsurprisingly, that didn't go down very well with Labour. How did they respond? Well, with some indignation and an attempt to force Boris Johnson's hand. Uh, so they had this idea that if he didn't appoint a new ethics supremo within two months, then Parliament would do the job for him. Now, ministers obviously rejected that and the attempt failed. However, during the debate beforehand, there were some Conservatives who were a bit unhappy at the idea that the Prime Minister might be going wobbly on the idea of a new ethics adviser, um, the feeling that that wasn't going to be a very good look for Boris Johnson or for the government. Um, the person who's always sent out to defend the Prime Minister on this is Michael Ellis, the Minister, who's a barrister. And uh, he said that the government, did, that Boris Johnson did intend to appoint a new ethics adviser and that there would be action swiftly. Not action actually to appoint a new adviser, but swift action to have a review into what to do about the whole thing. Lord Guy couldn't stomach it any longer, and I don't blame him. To this Prime Minister, Essex is a county east of London. The truth is, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the Prime Minister behaves as though it's one rule for him and another for the rest of us, because that's what he thinks. We can't endure another five months with no accountability in Downing Street. We can't endure, Madam Deputy Speaker, another five minutes of this. Since Lord Guite resigned, the government has refused to confirm if or how his ongoing investigations will continue. While the Prime Minister maintains the power of veto over the independent adviser, there is an inherent risk that he will overrule his own adviser. Well, today, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's time to show the Prime Minister he is not above the rules and for this House to draw a line in the sand. The Government remains steadfast in its absolute commitment to upholding standards in public life um, and the critical role of the ministerial code in supporting those standards. 
It is on account of that commitment that the government cannot support today's motion for the simple reason that it attempts by proxy to change the British constitution by the back door. If Labour's motion today were to succeed, uh, it could mean in the future a, a Labour-chaired committee choosing one of the Prime Minister's advisers, or a Conservative-chaired committee choosing a future Labour Prime Minister's advisers. That would lead to dysfunction, it would lead to, uh, frankly, gridlock, uh, and it would be entirely uh, impractical and unconstitutional. Can I just ask him, without a, a minister, an ethics advisor to the Prime Minister, the fact is that we as members of this House are held to higher standards of behaviour through the Code of Conduct than ministers are, that is a Prime Minister. So can I just ask him, what can he tell us about how, how the Prime Minister and the Government intend to move forward to make sure that we can all expect all ministers to be held to the highest possible standards, just as we are in this House? Well, I can certainly say to my right honourable friend that um, how and uh, who uh, uh, those sorts of questions are being worked through now uh, in detail. I'm gravely concerned by what I've just heard because a number of us um, have been um, given to understand before this uh, debate began that the government is willing to say that uh, there is a strong commitment to finding a replacement to Lord Guite, that the role will be succeeded, the role will be replaced, and that they want to proceed in short order to do that as fast as possible. I haven't heard the Minister say that. Will he please make that very clear right now? I, 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 I do apologise if I've not made that clear. I thought that I had, but it, that, is, that is the position, and, um, and I, can, I can confirm that. It's absolutely and abundantly clear that this government have absolutely no intention whatsoever of moving speedily to replace this government's ethics advisor. And if all of that crowd at the back benches of the Conservative Party appear to be taken in by this rubbish, then God help them when they're actually trying to consider some important issues of today. Thank you, Susan, for now. Um, let's go to Cardiff, where Felicity Evans can tell us what's been happening in the Welsh Parliament. Uh, Felicity, hello to you. Let's start with the rail strikes. They have obviously dominated uh, this week. The Welsh Labour leader and First Minister Mark Drakeford seem to be much more relaxed about his ministers and backbenchers appearing on picket lines than Keir Starmer did. Hi, Joe. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. Of course, Keir Starmer's warning to his front benchers not to appear on picket lines has been very controversial within the UK party. Here in Wales, where Labour is in government, a very different story. The First Minister, Mark Drakeford, said he had no problem with any of his ministers showing support for the trade union movement, as he put it. And indeed, on the first day of the strike on Tuesday, we saw eight Labour members of the Senedd, including three government ministers appearing on RMT uh, picket lines. But speaking at First Minister's questions, Mr Drakeford observed that Keir Starmer was operating under a different context in England. Bear in mind that here in Wales there is no rail strike. The train operating company Transport for Wales is not in dispute with the RMT, a point that the First Minister made when he was asked by the leader of the Welsh Conservatives whether he supported the strike. I am responsible for these things. Workers are not on strike because of the way in which the Welsh Government acts on a social partnership basis to bring people around the table together to make sure that conversations take place and solutions are reached. How very different from the entirely absent UK Government who abandon their responsibilities and mean that thousands of people are unable to travel due to the dereliction of duty, which is so apparent in their approach to industrial relations. Nothing like winding up the payroll vote to the unions, is there, when you hear them banging their desks? I didn't hear them banging their desks when they were supposed to be standing up for their constituents who were stuck on trains that couldn't provide a service on Transport for Wales. And when you go to Cardiff Central Station today, or the rail network in North Wales or Mid Wales, there are trains running, First Minister. 
Well, as you heard Andrew R.T. Davis say there, rail services in Wales are still affected by the strike, even though it isn't formally taking place here, and that's because Network Rail operates much of the track here in Wales. And Mark Drakeford accused Network Rail of moving workers from Wales over to England to help run some of the services in England on strike days, but Network Rail has denied that that is the case. Felicity, the Welsh Government's health minister has been in trouble over a driving ban and now she's had to formally apologise to the Welsh Parliament. That's right. It's back in March now that Elin Ed Morgan was given a six-month driving ban for speeding offences. After that happened, she was investigated by the Standards Watchdog here in the Senate, who said that she had demonstrated a disregard for the law. Well, this week, she was formally reprimanded by the Senate and made a formal apology in the Chamber. I'm aware that the role of elected representatives is to lead by example. There's an expectation on all of us to uphold the highest standards. And throughout this process, I've accepted that I failed to do so through my actions in this case. I'd like to place on record in the chamber my sincere remorse and deep regret for my actions. And I confirm that I pleaded guilty and accepted the court's judgment. I apologize unreservedly and wholeheartedly to you, my fellow Senate members, and to the people of Wales for the embarrassing position I've put myself and this respected institution in, and I want to say sorry to anyone who's been affected by my actions. The thing about this, though, Joe, is that it isn't only embarrassing for the health minister, it's embarrassing for her boss, too, the First Minister, Mark Drakeford. And that's because he had previously called on the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, to resign over Partygate, saying lawmakers can't be lawbreakers. But when Ilan Ed Morgan's offences came to light, Mr Drakeford didn't discipline her under the ministerial code, and he said there was no moral equivalence between her offence and and the Prime Minister's, which has led to the Welsh Conservatives to accuse him of practising double standards over this issue. The apology probably draws a line under all of this now, but Elin Ed Morgan is left with the dubious distinction of being the first Welsh Government Minister to be censured by the Senate. Yes, a difficult position to be in. Um, let's turn to something completely different. That's uh, questions about the Green Man Festival, because opposition parties have been continuing to press Welsh ministers about spending £4 million on a farm for the festival. Uh, give us some more detail. Yes, yeah, so the Welsh Government bought Gileston Farm in Monmouthshire for more than £4 million and said that they were in negotiations uh, with the people behind the Green Man Music Festival to either lease that land or to buy it. Uh, opposition parties, though, have questioned the decision to purchase the farm, especially since the people behind the festival say they have no plans to move from their current site, where they've been based for the last 20 years. Though BBC Wales understands that there are some proposals floating around that would maybe employ around 170 people on Gileston Farm to focus on things like sustainable farming, local food and climate change, with a commercial rent being paid to Welsh Government. But there's been no formal comment on that, either from Green Man or from the Welsh Government. The public spending watchdog has been asked to have a look at Minister's decision to purchase this farm and this week Plaid Cymru asked for a statement from the Economy Minister on whether or not the Welsh Government actually paid over the odds for the land. Finally, I note that the Minister said at the time that the Government didn't pay above market value for Gilestone and the amount paid was £4.25 million. However, this sales brochure here shows it for sale for £3.25 million, £1 million less than what the government paid for it. So can I ask that the Economy Minister brings an update to the Senate regarding the business plan for Gilestone and also clarify what, proposal, uh, what the government did to verify that the property value was correct? Uh, thank you. So the Welsh Government uh, is still uh, awaiting the business plan. What the Welsh Government will require and expects from that business plan is, is for Greenman to set out the activities to be undertaken throughout the year on the site, and that will include also how the land will continue to be farmed. Well, the Welsh Government insists it paid the market value for the land and the Climate Change Minister, Julie James, said the purchase was an attempt to secure the future of the Green Man Festival, one of the only independent festivals left in Europe.
Thank you very much, Felicity Evans, there at the Senate. Um, let's talk to Susan Hume again uh, about the war in Ukraine, uh, because actually the Prime Minister made a surprise visit to Kyiv, and MPs were discussing the UK's military support this week. What were they talking about? We've got used over the years uh, to hearing MPs, uh, particularly ones who've served in the military, calling for more defence spending. But that's really been sharpened up by the war in Ukraine. I think it has shown into, thrown into sharp focus um, just how much military hardware a real war uses up. So we've had the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, saying this week that the West had failed to stockpile enough ammunition. We've had the head of the army saying that the UK needs to do more to prepare for a potential showdown with Russia. So in, in this Commons debate, um, we had some very stout words from the minister, but there was a great deal of concern as well that we need to do more, really. Russia's assault on Ukraine is an unprovoked, premeditated attack against a sovereign democratic state which threatens global security. As set out to the House previously, the United Kingdom and NATO stand with Ukraine. We are providing political and practical support to support its self-defence and will further strengthen NATO's deterrence and defence posture. Individual NATO allies, led by the UK, are also supporting Ukraine with lethal aid to ensure Ukraine wins. As announced on 6 June 2022, we are providing cutting-edge multiple launch rocket systems which can strike targets up to 80 kilometres away with pinpoint accuracy, offering a significant boost in capability for the Ukrainian armed forces. Russia is not losing and Ukraine is not winning. The Prime Minister said, prepare for a long war. And the new head of the British Army seeks to reconfigure our land forces to potentially face Russia on the battlefield. This all starkly illustrates the long-term European security is threatened, not just by the utility of force, but a wider conflict between the West and growing authoritarianism. I say to the Minister, the tempo of these duties is unsustainable. We are overloading our troops with these widening commitments and not replenishing our defence stocks fast enough. All three services are now too small to manage the ever greater burden that we are now going to place on them. And those cuts in the 2021 20, integrated view of personnel and military equipment must now be reversed. We are making good use of the £24 billion uplift we have had since, um, since, since this government came into being. And that, Mr Speaker, is driving forward the agility and the deployability and the lethality uh, that we need in the, in the new global context. The new head of the army said in an internal message to troops last week, he said there is now a burning imperative to forge an army capable of fighting alongside our allies and defeating Russia in battle. So why are ministers pushing ahead with plans to cut another 10,000 yeah. soldiers? Yeah, yeah. When will he halt these cuts and when will he start to rebuild the strength of the British Army to meet the threats that our country and our NATO allies face? Uh, for too long, Mr Speaker, the measurement of our military capability is about men and vehicles in, in, in garrisons rather than our ability to project power. And that's something we are absolutely confident that we are getting right. The new head of the army, as has been mentioned already in this urgent question, has said the UK must forge an army capable of fighting alongside our allies and defeating Russia in battle. I found the Minister's response to the urgent question sounded a little complacent. Mm. Is he absolutely sure that that can be done whilst continuing with the 10,000 planned cuts in the army? Yeah. I, am I am confident, Mr Speaker, because this is, this, we, are, we have a significant increase in money that is, uh, is delivering new capabilities to make our people more lethal, more agile and more mobile. Uh, and and, and this, is, this, is, this is a body of work that's been uh, underway since uh, during the last couple of years, expressed in the Defence Command paper published in March 2021. This is nothing new. We've been at this for a couple of years, and, and rightly so. Thanks to Susan. And that's all for Politics UK for this week. I'll be back with you on BBC Two, but at the earlier time of 10.15 on Monday with Politics Live. And Politics UK will be on next Friday at 10.15am during the Wimbledon fortnight. So set your clock. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.